Thank you, Mama. <clears throat> Good morning, family. Good morning. Who else here has had a week this week? Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's had a week? I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those of you who are joining us uh, via live stream, we apologize for the break in the stream. Um, but the word that Mama gave to me at the earlier hours of this morning is that the word that's going to be released in the house today, the enemy is trying to hold back. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but there's going to be a break in the atmosphere today. Janine stands as proxy before us. On the power of God and the authority that he places in those who he has called to be sons. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning and we thank you for your confirmed presence in our lives. We sense your presence here with us, Father God. We acknowledge you. As one body, as a son, we are thankful that you have chosen to dwell amongst us. That you have chosen to invest your grace into our lives. Father, we break the barriers this morning that hold this word back. Because we know this is a word that will set your people free. We cancel every attack of the enemy. We declare that as firstborn sons of the Most High God. Nothing is too great for our God. Nothing is too difficult for our God. I bless your people this morning. I lift them up before you, Father God. And I bless them. May they receive your spirit. May they receive your grace in the fullest measure. We bless you, Father God. We thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, before I begin uh, the Sunday school, you may be excused. Kate is going to be taking care of you today. Well, I trust that you all are well and uh, had a productive week studying and meditating on the word of the Lord. Um, the word that was released to us by our spiritual father, Pastor Randolph Barnwell. I'm saying this because um, I believe it's become vitally important for us as it will allow us to begin to see the unfolding will of God um, for us as a house. The more we seek the more God will reveal to us, and the more God reveals to us, the clearer the picture becomes. Amen? Well, this morning, it's my highest honor and privilege to share the word with you. Um, John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning. So it is my highest honor to share Christ with you. I'd like to place on record, record my sincere thanks to our sp spiritual parents for entrusting me with this task. Uh, I don't take it lightly. This is a global platform. We are a global house. So the words that get released here can and only will be the word of God. This morning, I'd like to focus on a topic that I've titled Sonship Dominion. Um, this refers to the dominion of a son. And we've heard already from um, the testimonies and the workings of God in the lives of our people here at Gate Ministries, Durban Central. So when we look at this topic, we see that there's two aspects to it, an aspect of sonship and dominion. Now, individually, both topics, are, we can go quite in detail with this, but I'm just going to highlight certain aspects and show you how they correlate. So firstly, who are the sons of God? So there are extensive teachings on sons, sonship, um, identity, and we can find this on Pastor Randolph's web website. 
uh, Matthew Barnwell, his son, has also got some really good teachings on his website. But for me, what I want to speak about today is the fact that there are two major aspects to our sonship. The first would be redemption, and the second would be reconciliation. Being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ lifts you out of a fallen position. This is now where you are no longer held captive by the power of sin and death. But you live in the freedom of God's sanctification and grace. In addition to a reconciled position, uh, you are now returned to a covenantal relationship called sonship. Your sonship grants you access to all that God originally intended for man when he created man, firstly. And secondly, in addition to that, it gives you the inheritance of a son. Let's look at Romans 8. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ. Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So this is the first thing we need to cement in our mind about our sonship. It is not a physical relationship. It is spiritual. So it is not defined or bound by the limitations of what we understand as a relationship between a father and a son, a brother and a brother, a brother and a sister, or mother and son. See, when Christ redeemed us, he reconciled us, and his covenant allowed for us to be adopted as the sons of God. Now, as the sons of God, it made us co-heirs with Christ, giving us access to the divine nature, and therefore all the privileges and benefits of being called a son of God. Now, if we drop down to verse 7 of Romans 8, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then who, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This should be our heart's desire, to please God. It is our intended purpose, and it should be done out of sincere and pure love. In other words, it's not about what you do in the flesh. It's about how you live in the spirit. Pastor Randolph has given us a clear um, direction as to the three parts that we are made of, of spirit, soul, and body. And in his word, he, he says that our spirit should inform our soul how to live righteous in our bodies. Because sometimes what we do in the flesh can be seen as right, but it might not be driven by a righteous spirit. And if so, it does not please God. This is a place that we don't want to find ourselves in because if you are in enmity with God, it means that you are not at peace. And if you are not at peace, you are not of the spirit and therefore you are not of the same nature as God. Pleasing God means we fulfill his will and purpose. And the will of God is to reveal his glory in the earth as a representation called son. Now, I have a bit of a bias in the fact that I have a science background. So for me, a lot of the things need to balance out. So if I draw a parallel to something, it means X plus Y must equal Z or whatever it may be. The reason I say that is because when we follow the, when we follow the chain of how God intended us to live, we see that if you cannot represent your father in the earth, then you are not a son. I stand to be corrected. And if you are not a son, then you have no power or authority. In other words, you have no dominion on this earth. 
Verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirits, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Everyone with me? But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And by elimination, you are not of his nature, and you are not a partaker of the benefits and privileges that Christ has. And if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So I'm, I'm just highlighting a few points to show you what it means to be a son. It's not a title that we are given or we can just use loosely um, because you come to church um, or because you've changed your, your status um, but it's a position that you acquire by righteous living. No man can fool God. No man can fool God. And by expressing the nature of your heavenly father, you become his representation in the earth. And then in verse 14 it says, do we still have that scripture? Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Amen. Now if we look at verse 14, um, it says there that those who are led are sons. Simply. Led by the Spirit are sons. Now to be led by the Spirit means firstly, you must be of the Spirit or recognize the Spirit. That is, you need to be the same nature as the Spirit. Secondly, if you are led, it would imply that you should follow, or you must follow. But God has gifted us with free will. So the leading and our choice to follow, and if in choosing to do so, it means then that you accept whatever may come ahead of you. Whatever is on the path, you choose to accept because you choose to follow. And that is when God identifies and pronounces you as his son. The difficult thing about leading, about following someone who's leading and you don't know where they are going, is the fear of the unknown. You don't know what challenges God is taking you to. But you do know he'll always take you through. You don't know how difficult it is. But you always know that God will empower you, God will strengthen you, God will resource you. And in choosing to follow God, without knowing, but being certain, it is an act of unconditional love, trust, faith in God. You are only a son when you emulate the pattern designed by God. How do we do that? It is by our association with Christ. So Christ was the pattern son sent to the earth for how we as sons of God should live and exist in the earth. And by us following the pattern, by us associating with him, by us um, being joint heirs and partaking of his divine nature, we then live in the design and pattern that God had laid out for man in the earth. What we need to always remember about the fall of Adam was when Adam fell, he fell out of favor with God. Adam had the freedom to transition between realms. Adam had the freedom to talk to God and walk with God. And he took one act of disobedience. And just like that, he no longer represented the image and likeness of God. And because it's Women's Month, I'm not going to tell you about how it happened. So Christ... <laughs> 
So Christ, who bears the exact image of God, comes and restores us to a covenantal relationship. Now, the word covenant differs from a relationship because the word covenant is defined as an agreement entered into by two parties with God as the subject, whereas a relationship can sometimes be biased, you know? Um, we would have heard, learned from high school biology the different types of relationships. One where both parties benefit, one where one benefits and the other doesn't, you know? So it is not a parasitic relationship. It is one where you go into a, an agreement with God, with God as a subject. And we know that God is also defined as love. So your relationship there is then based on love. Christ has allowed us to gain access to our dominion mandate by lifting us up out of a fallen position. So that's just um, a few aspects to sonship. Um, and we need to understand that our, our first desire must be to be in that covenantal relationship with God. Because through that, we emulate, we represent, and we glorify God in the earth. Now, the Lord has placed a strong emphasis on matters relating to the dominion of sons, uh, especially in this house. If we track our teachings over the past year, a lot has been on suffering. We've gone through many teachings on suffering. And I don't believe that these messages or these words released are born out of a Bible study. Um, most of them are born out of case studies of living people. God knows where his people are and he will inform his servant on what to release to them, to equip them and resource them to sustain them even in the most difficult of times. Colossians 1.13 said, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Or the son of his love. Now we need to know and understand what I've just said to you so we can make sense of what will follow. The first mention of the word dominion related to man is found in Genesis 1.26. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the cattle over all the earth, and over every, every creeping thing that creeps. 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. So the Greek word for dominion is the word kratos, or kratos, which means strength or might. Uh, it's used in the sense of dominion, strength, power, or as a mighty deed. Now, dominion finds its root word um, to perfect or to complete. So what is God actually telling us in the scripture? Just put 26 back, Gary. God is saying to us that he will create a man in the earth that bears the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, functioning as they do, and he has given them the power to perfect or complete the processes in a created context. God has given us the power to perfect or complete the processes in a created context. There's so much that we can draw from the creation account. But I'm just going to highlight a few things. So when God gives us a word in when God gives me a word, there's always two questions I ask. Why and why now? I never ask why me. Why and why now? We need to understand the context to which God is releasing a word and the time. 
although God doesn't operate from our timeline, we need to understand or question or find or seek as to why God is giving us a specific word for a specific time. The reason for this is we must be a people of knowledge. Hosea 4.6 says, My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. They do not know why they are in their situations. Therefore, they do not know how to come out of it. Remember that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. The world is a system of confusion. So we are in the midst of confusion, but we are not confused because we have the word. And that is why we come to church. That is why we submit to a spiritual father. Because he supplies us with the necessary resources for us to lift ourselves up out of the situation. Let us make man. In the creation account, God says, let there be. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The following verses say, let there be, let there be, let there be. But at this point, when he chose to create his representation on the earth, he said, let us make man. God chose to highlight covenant, relationship, agreement, or confirmation. But it also emphasizes emphasizes the different aspects to God or the, dif the different facets of God. Moving on, we also gather that God will never give you or direct you to anything that he would ask you to bring under subjection if he hasn't resourced you for it first. God is saying, I will capacitate you to firstly, have the privilege of, or secondly, obey my command to perfect or complete my will in that, or for that intended purpose. We're still on the same scripture. Let us make man in our image. And let them have dominion. In our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion. So dominion is achieved or only results from our representation or our ability to reflect God or the image of God in the earth. Then God blessed them. Blessings come as a result of your representation and then your obedience. Blessings come as a result of your representation and your obedience. So what God gives you is also laid down a command. Subdue the earth. Subdue the created context as a representation of who I am. You got to relate this to where you are. In the application of this principle to the current generation, we must Focus on the fact that dominion will only fall on those who are born again into Christ and have become partakers of his divine nature. The earth and the, and the abundance thereof is the Lord's. Verse 28, then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have do dominion. Again. Bringing things under subjection and having dominion over them, whatever it may be, is as a result of being created in the image and likeness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. I believe the reason God is bringing this word to our attention is so that we can draw on the knowledge, the power, and the authority given to us by our spiritual Father. To have dominion over the things that may cause us to veer off our path. And we need to see and draw on all aspects in God. Always remember this, that God designed man before he created the context. Although many parts of the created universe came before God created man, he had a design for man before he created the context. Let me make this real. Before God had brought you to a specific challenge in your life, he had a design of you 
that you would withstand that, that you would be able to bring that context into subjection, that you would have dominion over what you may see, see as the most difficult challenge of your life. But then God also prepared all the necessary plans and put measures in place if you chose not to. Is everyone with me? See, God had the full knowledge of what would happen before he placed man in that context. God designed you to withstand any intensity of any trial or test. But he's given you the free will to decide whether you serve him when things seem unbearable. It's difficult to pay your tithe when you had an unexpected expense for the month. It's difficult to give your offering when your light bulb has, has come so much that they cut off your lights. So what do you do? Choose to live in darkness or honor God. This is how we really test whether we receive this word or not. Being practical and being real. Because if we choose to serve God, obey God and his principles, even when things are against us, it is the ultimate expression of love. What we fail to see at times is that God's timing is not always what we'd like it to be. When I stood up here and I asked, who's had a week? We've all had a week. And you get multiple things happening at the same time. When it rains, it storms. But the thing with enduring suffering is that we've been trained for it. Today it's difficult to do one push-up, but you do it. Ten days from now you're doing 20 push-ups and you've forgotten that the first push-up was such a challenge. Today you're huffing and puffing to walk upstairs, but when your apartment is on the second floor and you've got no choice, it becomes second nature. I've got to get home. There is no growth without adversity. Even when it hurts, I will honor and obey you and sacrifice even what's most dear to me because of my unconditional love. We follow the pattern because that's what God did for us. God laid down the life of his only begotten son because of unconditional love. And if we are able to do the same, what does that mean? We emulate and we express the exact image of Christ the exact image of God, the likeness of God in the earth, and thus we have dominion over anything that comes before us. Just a little detour. The creation of the earth and man were not the first decisions made by God in the Godhead. Did we know that? From scripture we learn about what was actually going on before the creation account. Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. We all know that. What does that mean? It means that salvation existed even before the earth was formed. It was already established. This also means that there was a conversation or a decision and confirmation in the Godhead that redemption would be necessary for sons of God. This also showed us that love existed before the foundation of the earth. A sacrifice that God prepared for you and I. The covenantal relationship that would exist throughout time and even outside of time of a father and a son. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us before the foundation of the world. Go down to verse 5. Oh no, go back Gary, sorry. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Next verse. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good will, good pleasure 
of his will. See the last verse? To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. John 17, 24 says the latter part, you love me before the foundation of the world. So much of the teaching, teachings that we've received have been related to or express some form of the believer's suffering. Most recently, we studied the books of First and Second Peter. Who enjoyed those? Um, when we understand the context of the believers who Peter is writing to, it makes us feel that what Peter is asking to, them to do is even more difficult. So without going into too much detail, I just want to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture, so is it cool enough for us to be awake? 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh ceased from sin. That he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and ab abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you not, do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Let's go down to verse 7. So from verse 7 onwards, the New King James titles the serving for God's glory. The latter part of verse 7 says, love will cover a multitude of sins. Verse 10. As each one at as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards and the manifold grace of God. I want you all to keep this in mind. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this speaks of an eternal dominion through which Christ obtained by defeating death on the cross. So in this portion of scripture, we see three things. We see suffering, we see dominion and glory. Suffering for God's glory. What does it mean for us to suffer for God's glory? And what does glory signify to us as sons in the earth? Verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. So there are a number of in-depth teachings on suffering, but I'd like to say this. Our periods of suffering create the ideal context for which the ideal context and the perfect timing of God to reveal his nature. Simply put, this is when we can see the power, the strength, the might, the peace, the love of God be revealed and allow for us to get more of his restorative nature but here's the thing God's grace must not only be emitted as a result of the above mentioned things in other words we must not try to emulate God only when we've come to the end of our trials we must not talk about the glory of God only when we have seen that his power can take us out but we must express God's grace even when we are in the midst of our trial God must be seen in us even when we are suffering. God must be seen in us even when we are challenged, even when, even when things are against us. Because when we suffer for Christ's sake or for righteousness sake, 
It means then that, firstly, you would have been prepared for it. The lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Secondly, it will not last forever, meaning it will come to an end. There is a purpose for it, and God will sustain and resource you through it. These are all references to the creation account. Verse 14 said, if you, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And let's go quickly to 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of his glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock. Let's stop there. So amidst everything that you are going through, amidst all the difficulty, amidst all the challenges, amidst all that you have to obey, amidst all that you have to conform to, all that you have to do for yourself, God is then asking you to shepherd the flock. Take care of my people. Take care of what belongs to me. And if in doing so, you show me that you are my representative. Because my people should be your people. So the concern I have for my flock, you should have. So the care and the investment I would have for my flock, you should have. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but by willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. This takes us back to Genesis 126, 128, where God says, subdue it. The other meaning for this is, to bring it under subjection means to manage it. And this must always be done for the good of the inhabitants. In our lives, we may experience things that are beyond our control things that we do not understand or feel is unfair. But we need to be at peace in knowing that God is sovereign. We need to be at peace in knowing that God's timing is perfect. God has called us and God has elected us. He has predestined us and ordained us. Therefore, do not be afraid. For in due time, God will make you or send to you a redeemer in the form of a son. It has to be a son, because it is only a son who has the authority given to him to restore you and for you to regain your dominion, your power, your might, and your ability to perfect God's will. There's a saying that says, if God has brought you to it, he will take you through it. I am saying, if God has brought you to it, he has already prepared for it. God knew man would sin. So Christ was a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. And at a divinely appointed time, God sent Christ to the earth to redeem us. So let's get real. Let's get practical and understand what this means for us in our lives. Again, I ask, how many of us have gone through or are going through intense trials or suffering? So severe that it may even lead to your death. But fortunately, through wise counsel and the words released to you from a son of God, it saved you. Anyone had that experience? Such a severe situation that all you could think about is the fact that the only way out is death. A challenge so difficult that you felt you cannot come back from. 
What God is saying is that when you go through these trials and intense suffering, and in areas where you may fall and feel too weak, I have my son, Randolph, who I have prepared with wise counsel and word, and I will release him to you into your life at a divinely appointed time to redeem you and restore you to your elevated position where you regain your dominion. You may have been sick in a car accident or lost a child. God is saying that at this point of your intense suffering where you do not understand, I have prepared for it. I have my son, Renee, who I have blessed with a gift of healing at a, at a divinely appointed time. I will release her into your life and save you and redeem you and lift you out of that fallen position for you to regain your dominion. This is the function of God in the earth through the media of sons. How many of you remember Kate's story? Her testimony of the miraculous work of God. So for those of you who don't know, Kate was born with a rare heart condition that the most qualified professionals in the land estimated that she wouldn't live past the age of five. Is that right? 39 years later, she's still here irritating all of us. Um, I'm just joking about her age. Um, so this required her to use a pacemaker, what was initially thought to have been for the rest of her life. Born with a rare heart condition, operated on as a baby, had a pacemaker installed. The most qualified professionals, the most advanced technology and medical science said that she can only survive in this earth with a device that is so advanced it would recognize when your heartbeat drops too low and kick in so that you stay alive. A couple of years ago, about a year ago, she decided to join Jody's fitness class, just to keep fit. The foolishness of God is wiser than all the wisdom of men. And by doing so, she brought her heart back to a position where she no longer needed a pacemaker. God has said that even if you come to a situation that is beyond your control and not because of anything you've done, that even the most qualified professionals in the land don't estimate you live longer than five years. I have my son who has not even been born yet and I will equip him in the form of Jody with the necessary resources and at a divinely appointed time, I will release him into your life. For you to regain your power and authority. You have come to this house at a divinely appointed time. Coming into this environment means that you have come into a covenantal relationship with the sons of a father. And by committing to this environment, by obeying the words of God, by living accord, according to his righteous standards with your brothers and sisters, makes you a son to the Father. And as a son, you now have access to the power and authority, the dominion given to us by your Father. This morning, Gate DC, the Lord says to you, draw on the gifts that he has given to you. Not only to redeem yourself, but those around you. And when you come back to God's original intent for why he put man on this, on this earth, you will understand what it means to be a son. You will accept what it means to be at a position called son and what it gives you access to. You will have the authority to say to the storm, peace, be still. So this morning I pray that the word has blessed you. 
it is not something that we need to go into too much detail with. Because I believe God has released the word into your lives. Your sonship is what gives you access to dominion. You can do all the Bible studies you want. Go to all the prayer meetings. But if you do not accurately represent your father on the earth, you have no power. You can use all the correct language and lay hands on people. But if you do not have the spirit of your father, there will be no change. There will be no healing. There will be no breakthrough. There will be no uh, cancelling of anything that seems like it's against God. It is your sonship that gives you access to power and authority. Jody, come. It's a big guy. The Lord says he's going to use you to change lives, to restore people, to give people back their power and authority. You might not understand it, whether young or old, but the Lord has his hand upon you. You have lived what he has asked us to. That in your time of intense trial and difficulty, you have emulated the exact representation of God in the earth. Many are waiting for them to come to a position where they are comfortable. But you are doing it from an uncomfortable position. Many are waiting for them to be resourced before they resource. But you do the most with the little you have. Don't take for granted what God has given you. Your words and your actions affect change in those around you. Apart from your stature, God sees you massive in the spirit. God sees your strength. God sees your power. God sees you as a pure and clean vessel. One in which he has chosen to affect change in the earth. I see you standing amongst the mighty men of God. Who will stand by and lift up the hands of your father. That when he is in times of difficulty. It will be your reflexive response to lift him up. God has great things in store for you. But don't look for them. Continue doing what you are doing. So when you come into those blessings and, those, and, and these favor, it will not be uncommon. It will be as a result of the life that you've always lived. God is going to bless you with good health and long life. And God has prepared someone for you that will stand by in equal stature with you. That the covenant you two will share will change nations. So allow God to lead you. Don't lead your own way. Allow God to lead you. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for this young man. We pray special blessings over his life. We pray that you keep him in the palm of your hand and you continue to use him as you have done. We as a house thank you for him. We bless him today as a corporate body. We honor him, Father God. We lift him up to the highest of highs, a place that he deserves to be because he has represented you accurately. Allow for breakthrough to come into his life. The hard work and the labor, Father God, must pay off. Not because we ask it, but because you have declared it. Because your word will never return to you void, Father God. 
and those who labor in the kingdom do not labor in vain. You have opened doors for him, Father God. And he has seen them. Now allow for him to watch as the increase burst forth through those open doors. Allow for the fruitfulness of his work to come to bear, Father God. Let there be a rushing and a gushing of all that you have in store for him. Because he is more than able not to be overwhelmed by these things. He stands here as a proxy, Father God, for many others who will follow in his path. As he, follow you, as he follows you, allow others to follow him. So we bless you now and we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for that powerful word on your sonship as your dominion. And we know as the Bible says, as many as received him, to, you are the sons of God and he gives you power to become the sons of God. So each one of you are a son of God because you've received Christ and your dominion is in your sonship. But like Jeremy said, you've got to accurately reflect Christ in your lives by living by his principles, reflect his image and likeness in everything you do. And God uses the sons to even restore, to heal. So if the world is dying and whatever need they have, God uses sons with authority and power from himself. But I urge you, as you, you can sense the, the groan in Jeremy, the groan that um, the dominion of sonships is, is for those who reflect Christ accurately. So I want to say, if there's anything in our lives, if there's anything that's inhibiting and, 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 and blocking grace from flowing in authority and dominion, let's come before the Lord. God's given us power even to overcome the, those things. Let's live lives pleasing before God and so that God can use us as conduit. So that, that power is yours. And we pray that um, we know God's word doesn't return to him void, that even as we leave this place today, that we understand the fullness of the dominion we have to subdue the earth as sons of the Most High God. And so, you know what also came to mind when you were speaking, when Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish, and he could have fed everybody and said, everyone be filled with it or something, but he needed the help of the disciples. And he said, go into groups and you go to that group and you go to that group. He used his sons, his spiritual sons. And so the work is so mighty. You know, this world, Sin is maturing as well and getting more and more wicked. And God needs sons. He needs you and I to bring reconciliation and restoration to the lost and the dying. And even those in the kingdom, there are some that are weak and they're bending their knees. And you just need to go alongside and lift them up. He needs strong sons. So I want to encourage you, fortify yourself. Don't let this dominion leak out of you uh, in vain. But God's given you power as sons of God to subdue the earth and to bring wholeness to fellow uh, humans on this earth. And so I want to encourage you to build yourself up and to fortify yourself to be used mightily as sons of God, representing him accurately. So we bless you, Jeremy, for the word. Thank you. Jeremy had a most trying week this week. And, you know, it always happens when you speak in that week everything goes wrong and that's just to deter you from the word that you want to share the enemy wants to distract you to say can you ask somebody else but he pushed through and pushed through and we receive that word as a word from the lord and we don't take our sonship for granted we don't take god's power for granted at the end of the day everything we do and say even the testimonies that i mentioned earlier i forgot to mention carl is one of them too the walking testimony before us that everything it's all about giving God glory. That when God is glorified, glorified means God has made big in our lives for others to say, for the, the non-believer to say, wow, I want what they have. There's a God there. So that's when you magnify and you glorify God in your life. You're pointing them to Christ. You're not pointing them to you. You're not pointing them to Gate Ministries, Durban Central. We want God to be glorified in our lives so that the lost may be saved. That, that in itself is an evangelistic tool. And so bless you. Leave here pondering on the word. Go and uh, apologies again for the technical difficulties. It's low shading in the area. So there were problems picking up the Wi-Fi. But um, God's word has been released and we receive it in Jesus' name. 
So don't rush off. Next door there is tea. Please go immediately to be seated. And uh, let's enjoy fellowship with each other and have a graceful week. As you fast, you are getting fat in the spirit. You may lose weight because you're fasting, but you are getting mafuta in the spirit, okay? Full of power next week. Expect the miracles even in church next week because we're going to be prayed up, fasted up, you know, fasted and Really, we're providing the context for God to, to uh, move. But remember, the context is also oneness. Oneness amongst us. There were one accord in the room, the upper room, and God moved mightily. So we must also work on relationships. Even now when you go for tea, ch chat to somebody you don't usually chat with. Build relationships because when oneness is in the house, there's no stopping what God can do. Once again, we celebrate with the Babas that's coming, Janine and Wesley. You have, we celebrate and we rejoice with you of the doings of the Lord in your life. Amen. God bless you.